623. By this explanation, my dearest, thou wilt be able to satisfy thy doubts, and thou wilt understand what a bitter evil so many souls incur, whom the Lord has redeemed by his blood, placed in the way of light and drawn toward himself, and how some persons can fall from a more exalted state into more perverse obstinacy than others below them in station. This truth is well illustrated in the mystery of my son's passion, in which the priests, scribes, and the whole people were much more indebted to their God than the heathen who knew not of the true religion. I desire that this truth, as exhibited by their example, convince thee of this terrible danger and excite in thee holy fear. And with this fear, join humble thanks and an exalted esteem of the favors of the Lord. In the days of abundance, be not unmindful of the hour of want. Ecclesiastes 13.25 Ponder as well the one as the other within thyself, and remember that thou carriest thy treasure in a fragile vessel, which thou canst easily lose. 2 Corinthians 4.7 Know well that the reception of such blessings argues not merit, and the possession of them is not due to thee in justice, but comes to thee by liberality and kindness. That the Most High has favored thee with so much familiar intercourse is no assurance that thou canst not fall, and no license to live carelessly and without reverence and fear. All things happen to thee according to the number and greatness of thy blessings, for the wrath of the serpent has increased toward thee in proportion, and is more alert against thee than against other souls. He has become aware that the Most High has not been so liberally loving to men of so many generations as towards thee. And if thou meet so many blessings and mercies with ingratitude, thou shalt be most wretched and worthy of a rigorous punishment, against which thou canst make no objections. Chapter 20 Our Savior, by order of Pilate, is scourged, crowned with thorns, and mocked. The behavior of the Most Holy Mary during this time. 624 Pilate, aware of the obstinate hostility of the Jews against Jesus of Nazareth, and unwilling to condemn him to death, of which he knew him to be innocent, thought that a severe scourging of Jesus might placate the fury of the ungrateful people and soothe the envy of the priests and the scribes. If he should have failed in anything pertaining to their ceremonies and rites, they would probably consider him sufficiently chastised and cease in their persecutions and in their clamors for his death. Pilate was led to this belief by what they had told him in the course of his trial, for they had vainly and foolishly calumniated Christ of not observing the Sabbath and other ceremonies as is evident from his sermons reported by the evangelists, John 9, 6. But Pilate was entirely wrong in his judgment and acted like an ignorant man, for neither could the master of all holiness be guilty of any defect in the observance of that law which he had come not to abolish but to fulfill, Matthew 5, 7. Nor, even if the accusation had been true, would he have deserved such an outrageous punishment. For the laws of the Jews, far from demanding such an inhuman and cruel scourging, contained other regulations for atonement for more common faults. And still greater error was this judge in expecting any mercy or natural kindness and compassion from the Jews. Their anger and wrath against the most meek master was not human not such as ordinarily is appeased by the overthrow and humiliation of the enemy. For men have hearts of flesh, and the love of their own kind is natural and the source of at least some compassion. But these perfidious Jews were clothed in the guise of demons, or rather transformed into demons, who exert the more furious rage against those who are rendered more helpless and wretched, who, when they see anyone most helpless, say, Let us pursue him now since he has none to defend, nor free him from our hands. 6.25 Such was the implacable fury of the priests and of their confederates, the Pharisees against the author of life. For Lucifer, despairing of being able to hinder his murder by the Jews, inspired them with his own dreadful malice and outrageous cruelty. Pilate, placed between the known truth and his human and terrestrial considerations, chose to follow the erroneous leading of the latter, and ordered Jesus to be severely scourged, though he had himself declared him free of guilt. John 19.1 Thereupon those ministers of Satan with many others brought Jesus our Savior to the place of punishment, which was a courtyard or enclosure attached to the house, and set apart for the torture of criminals in order to force them to confess their crimes. 
It was enclosed by a low, open building surrounded by columns, some of which supported the roof, while others were lower and stood free. To one of these columns, which was of marble, they bound Jesus very securely, for they still thought him a magician and feared his escape. 626. They first took off the white garment with not less ignominy than when they clothed him therein in the house of the adulterous homicide Herod. In loosening the ropes and chains which he had borne since his capture in the garden, they cruelly widened the wounds which his bonds had made in, the, in his arms and wrists. Having freed his hands, they commanded him with infamous blasphemies to despoil himself of the seamless tunic which he wore. This was the identical garment with which his most blessed mother had clothed him in Egypt when he first began to walk, as I have related in its place. Our Lord at present had no other garment, since they had taken from him his mantle or cloak when they seized him in the garden. The Son of the Eternal Father obeyed the executioners and began to unclothe himself, ready to bear the shame of the exposure of his most sacred and modest body before such a multitude of people. By his tormentors, impatient at the delay which modesty required, tore away the tunic with violence in order to hasten his undressing and, as is said, flay the sheep with the wool. With the exception of a strip of cloth for a cincture, which he wore beneath the tunic, and with which his mother likewise had clothed him in Egypt, the Lord stood now naked. These garments had grown with his sacred body, nor had he ever taken them off. The same is to be said of his shoes, which his mother had placed on his feet. However, as I have said on a former occasion, he had many times walked barefooted during his preaching. 627. I understand that some of the doctors have said or have persuaded themselves that our Savior Jesus had his scourging and his crucifixion, for his greater humiliation permitted the executioners to despoil him of all his clothing. But having again been commanded under holy obedience to ascertain the truth in this matter, I was told that the Divine Master was prepared to suffer all the insults compatible with decency that the executioners attempted to subject his body to the shame of total nakedness, seeking to despoil him of the cincture which covered his loins. But in that they failed, because on touching it their arms became paralyzed and stiff, as had happened also in the house of Caiaphas when they attempted to take off his clothes. Chapter 17 All the six of his tormentors separately made the attempt with the same result. Yet afterwards these ministers of evil, in order to scourge him with greater effect, raised some of the coverings, for so much the Lord permitted, but not that he should be uncovered and despoiled of his garments entirely. The miracle of their being hindered and paralyzed in their brutal attempts did not, however, move or soften the hearts of these human beasts, but in their diabolical insanity they attributed it all to the supposed sorcery and witchcraft of the author of truth and life. 628. Thus the Lord stood uncovered in the presence of a great multitude, and the six torturers bound him brutally to one of the columns, in order to chastise him so much the more at their ease. Then two and two at a time they began to scourge him with such inhuman cruelty as was possible only in men possessed by Lucifer, as were these executioners. The first two scourged the innocent Savior with hard and thick cords full of rough knots, and in their sacrilegious fury stained all the powers of their body to inflict the blows. This first scourging raised in the deified body of the Lord great welts and livid tumors so that the sacred blood gathered beneath the skin and disfigured his entire body. Already it began to ooze through the wounds. The first two having at length desisted, the second pair continued the scourging in still greater emulation. With hardened leather thongs they leveled their strokes upon the places already sore and caused the discolored tumors to break open and shed forth the sacred blood until it bespattered and drenched the garments of the sacrilegious torturers running down also in streams to the pavement. These two gave way to the third pair of scourgers, who commenced to beat the Lord with extremely tough rawhides, dry, hard, like oyster twigs. They scourged him still more cruelly because they were wounding not so much his virginal body as cutting into the wounds already produced by the previous scourging. Besides, they had been secretly incited to greater fury by the demons who were filled with new rage at the patience of Christ. 629 
As the veins of the sacred body had now been opened and his whole person seemed but one continued wound, the third pair found no more room for new wounds. Their ceaseless blows inhumanly tore the immaculate and virginal flesh of Christ our Redeemer and scattered many pieces of it about the pavement, so much so that a large portion of the shoulder bones were exposed and showed red through the flowing blood. In other places also the bones were laid bare, larger than the palm of the hand, in order to wipe out entirely that beauty which exceeded that of all the other men. Psalm 44.3 They beat him in the face and in the feet and hands, thus leaving unwounded not a single spot in which they could exert their fury and wrath against the most innocent lamb. The divine blood flowed to the ground, gathering here and there in great abundance. The scourging in the face and in the hands and feet was unspeakably painful, because these parts are so full of sensitive and delicate nerves. His venerable countenance became so swollen and wounded that the body and the swellings blinded him. In addition to their blows, the executioners spirited upon his person their disgusting spittle and loaded him with insulting epithets. The exact number of blows was dealt out to the Savior from head to foot was 5,115. The great Lord and author of all creation, who by his divine nature was incapable of suffering, was in his human flesh and for our sake reduced to a man of sorrows, as prophesied, and was made to experience our infirmities, becoming the last of men. Isaiah 53.3 A man of sorrows and the outcast of the people. 6.30 The multitudes who had followed the Lord filled up the courtyard of Pilate's house and the surrounding streets. For all of them waited for the issue of this event, discussing and arguing about it according to each one's views. Amid all this confusion, the Virgin Mary endured unheard of insult, and she was deeply afflicted by the injuries and blasphemies heaped upon her divine Son by the Jews and Gentiles. When they brought Jesus to the scourging place, she retired in the company of the Marys and St. John to a corner of the courtyard. Assisted by her divine vision, she there witnessed all the scourgings and the torments of our Savior. Although she did not see it with the eyes of her body, nothing was hidden to her, no more than if she had been standing quite near. Human thoughts cannot comprehend how great and how diverse were the afflictions and sorrows of the great queen and mistress of the angels, together with many other mysteries of the divinity that shall become manifest in the next life for the glory of the Son and Mother. I have already mentioned in other places of this history, and especially in that of the Passion, that the Blessed Mother felt in her, her own body all the torments of her son. This was true also of the scourging which she felt in all the parts of her virginal body, in the same intensity as they were felt by Christ in his body. Although she shed no blood except what flowed from her eyes with her tears, nor was lacerated in her flesh, yet the bodily pain so changed and disfigured her that St. John and the holy women failed to find in her any resemblance of herself. Besides the tortures of the body, she suffered ineffable sorrows of the soul. There, sorrow was augmented in proportion to the immensity of her insight. For her sorrows flowed not only from the natural love of a mother and of a supreme love of Christ as her God, but it was proportioned to her power of judging more accurately than all the creatures of the innocence of Christ, the dignity of his divine person, the atrocity of the insults coming from the perfidious Jews and the children of Adam, whom he was freeing from eternal death. 6.31 Having at length executed the sentence of scourging, the executioners unbound the Lord from the column, and with imperious and blasphemous presumption, commanded him immediately to put on his garment. But while they had scourged the most meek master, one of his tormentors, instigated by the devil, had hidden his clothes out of sight in order to prolong the nakedness and exposure of his divine person, for their derision and sport. This evil purpose, suggested by the devil, was well known in the mother of the Lord. She therefore, making use of her power as queen, commanded Lucifer and all his demons to leave the neighborhood, and immediately compelled by her sovereign power and virtue, they fled. She gave orders that the tunic be brought by the holy angels within reach of her most holy son, so that he could again cover his sacred and lacerated body. All this was immediately attended to. Although the sacrilegious executioners understood not the miracle, nor how it had been wrought, they attributed it all to sorcery and magic of the demon. During this protracted nakedness, our Savior had, in addition to his wounds, suffered greatly from the cold of that morning as mentioned by the evangelists. 
Mark 14.55, Luke 22.35, John 18.18. 18. His sacred blood had frozen and compressed the wounds, which had become inflamed and extremely painful. The cold had diminished his powers of resistance, although the fire of his infinite charity strained them to the utmost in order to suffer more and more. Though compassion is so natural and rational creatures, there was none for him in his affliction and necessity, except that of his sorrowful mother who tearfully bewailed and pitied him in the name of the whole human race. 632. Among other divine mysteries hidden to the wise of this world, this also caused great astonishment that the wrath of the Jews, who were men of flesh and blood like ourselves, should not have been appeased at their seeing Christ torn and wounded by 5,115 lashes, that the sight of a person so lacerated should not have moved their natural compassion, but should arouse their envy to inflict new and unheard of tortures upon the victim. Their implacable fury at once planned another outrageous cruelty. They went to Pilate and in the presence of his counselors said, This seducer and deceiver of the people, Jesus of Nazareth, in his boasting and vanity is sought to be recognized by all as the king of the Jews. In order that his pride may be humbled and his presumption be confounded, we desire your permission to place upon him the royal insignia merited by his fantastic pretensions. Pilate yielded to the unjust demand of the Jews, permitting them to proceed according to their intentions. 6.33 Thereupon they took Jesus to the Praetorium, where, with the same cruelty and contempt, they again despoiled him of his garments, and in order to deride him before all the people as a counterfeit king, clothed him in a much torn and soiled mantle of purple color. They placed also upon his sacred head a cap made of woven thorns to serve him as a crown. John 19.2 This cap was woven of thorn branches and in such a manner that many of the hard and sharp thorns would penetrate into the skull, some of them to the ears and others to the eyes. Hence, one of the greatest tortures suffered by the Lord was that of the crown of thorns. Instead of a scepter, they placed into his hands a contemptible reed. They also threw over his shoulders a violet-colored mantle, something of the style of capes worn in churches, for such a garment belonged to the vestiture of a king. In this array of a mock king, the perfidious Jews decked out him, who by his nature and by every right was the king of kings and the lord of lords. Then all the soldiers in the presence of the priests and Pharisees gathered around him and heaped upon him their blasphemous mockery and derision. Some of them bent their knees and mockingly said to him, God save thee, king of the Jews. Others buffeted him. Others snatched the cane from his hands and struck him on his crowned head. Others ejected their disgusting spittle upon him. All of them, instigated by furious demons, insulted and affronted him in different manners. 634 O charity incomprehensible and exceeding all measure, O patience never seen or imagined among mortals, who, O my Lord and God, since thou art the true and mighty God, both in essence and in thy works, who could oblige thee to suffer the humiliation of such unheard of torments, insults, and blasphemies? On the contrary, O my God, who among men have not done many things which offend thee, and which should have caused thee to refuse suffering, and to deny them thy favor. Who could ever believe all this if we knew not of any infinite goodness? But now, since we see it, and in firm faith look upon such admirable blessings and miracles of love, where is our judgment? What effect upon us the light of truth? What enchantment is this that we suffer, since at the very sight of thy sorrows, scourges, thorns, insults, and affronts, we seek for ourselves without the least shame or fear the delights, the riches, the ease, the preferments and vanities of this world. Truly great is the number of fools, since the greatest foolishness and dishonesty is to recognize a debt and be unwilling to pay it, to receive blessings and never give thanks for them, to have before one's eyes the greater good and despise it, to claim it for ourselves and make no use of it, to turn away and fly from life and seek eternal death. 
The most innocent Jews opened not his mouth in those great and many injuries. Nor was the furious wrath of the Jews appeased, either by the mockery and derision of the divine master, or by the torments added to the contempt of his most exalted person. 635. It seemed to Pilate that the spectacle of a man so ill-treated as Jesus of Nazareth would move and fill with shame the hearts of that ungrateful people. He therefore commanded Jesus to be brought from the praetorium to an open window, where all could see him crowned with thorns, disfigured by the scourging and of the ignominious vestiture of a mock king. Pilate himself spoke to the people, calling out to them, Ecce homo! Behold, what a man! See this man, whom you hold as your enemy. What more can I do with him than to have him punished in this severe manner? You certainly have nothing more to fear from him. I do not find any cause of death in him. What this judge said was certainly the full truth, but in his own words he condemned his outrageous injustice since knowing and confessing that this man was just and not guilty of death, he had nevertheless ordered him to be tormented and punished in such a way that according to the natural course he should have been killed many times over. O oh, blindness of self-love! O oh, hellish malice of estimating only the influence of those who can confer or take away mere earthly dignities. How deeply do such motives obscure the reason? How much do they twist the course of justice? How completely do they pervert the greatest truths in judging the just by the standards of the unjust? Terrible, ye judges of the earth, Psalm 210, look to it that the sentences you render are not full of deceit. For you yourselves shall be judged and condemned by your unjust judgment. As the priests and Pharisees, in their eager and insatiable hostility, were irrevocably bent upon taking away the life of Christ our Savior, nothing but his death would content or satisfy them. Therefore they answered Pilate, Crucify him! Crucify him! 636 when the blessed among women, Most Holy Mary, saw her divine son as Pilate showed him to the people and heard him say, Ecce homo, she fell upon her knees and openly adored him as the true God-man. The same was also done by St. John and the holy women together with all the holy angels of the Queen and Lady. For they saw that not only Mary, as the mother of the Savior, but that God himself desired them thus to act. The most prudent lady spoke to the Eternal Father, to the angels, and especially to her most beloved Son, precious words of sorrow, compassion, and profound reverence, possible to be conceived only in her chaste and love inflamed bosom. In her exalted wisdom, she pondered also the ways and means by which the evildoers of his innocence could be made most opportunely manifest at a time when he was so insulted, mocked, and despised by the Jews. With this most proper intention, she renewed the petitions above mentioned, namely that Pilate, in his quality of judge, continue to maintain the innocence of Jesus our Redeemer, and that all the world should understand that Jesus was not guilty of death, nor of any of the crimes imputed to him by the Jews. 637. On account of these prayers of the Most Blessed Mother, Pilate was made to feel great compassion at seeing Jesus so horribly scourged and ill-treated, and regret at having punished him so severely. Although he was naturally disposed to such emotions by his soft and compassionate disposition, yet they were principally caused by the light he received through the intercession of the Queen and Mother of Grace. This same light moved the unjust judge after the crowning of thorns to prolong his parley with the Jews for the release of Christ, as is recorded in the 19th chapter of the Gospel of St. John. When they again asked him to crucify the Lord, he answered, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I do not find any cause for doing it. They replied, According to our law, he is guilty of death, for he claims to be the Son of God. This reply threw Pilate into greater consternation, for he received it might be true that Jesus was the Son of God according to his heathen notions of the divinity. Therefore he withdrew with Jesus into the praetorium, where, speaking with him alone, he asked whence he was. The Lord did not answer this question, 
for Pilate was not in a state of mind either to understand or merit a reply. Nevertheless, he insisted and said to the king of heaven, Dost thou not speak to me? Dost thou not know that I have the power to crucify thee and the power to dismiss thee? Pilate sought to move him to defend himself and tell what he wanted to know. It seemed to Pilate that a man so wretched and tormented would gladly accept any offer of favor from a judge. 638. But the master of truth answered Pilate without defending himself, but with unexpected dignity, for he said, Thou shouldst not have any power against me, unless it were given thee from above. Therefore he that hath delivered me to thee hath the greater sin. This answer by itself made the condemnation of Christ inexcusable in Pilate, since he could have understood therefrom that neither he nor Caesar had any power or jur jurisdiction over this man Jesus, that by a much higher decree he had been so unreasonably and justly delivered over to his judgment, that therefore Judas and the priests had committed a greater sin than he in not releasing him, and that nevertheless he was too guilty of the same crime, though not in such high degree. Pilate failed to arrive at these mysterious truths, but he was struck with still greater consternation at the words of Christ our Lord, and therefore made still more strenuous efforts to liberate him. The priests were now abundantly aware of his intentions, threatened him with the displeasure of the emperor, which he would incur if he permitted this one, who had aspired to be king, to escape death. They said, If thou freest this man, thou art no friend of Caesar, since he, who makes a king of himself, rises up against his orders and commands. They urged this because the Roman emperors never permitted anyone in the whole empire to assume the title or insignia of a king without their consent and order. If, therefore, Pilate should permit it, he would contravene the decrees of Caesar. He was much disturbed at this malicious and threatening intimation of the Jews, and seating himself in his tribunal at the sixth hour in order to pass sentence upon the Lord, he once more turned to plead with the Jews, saying, See there your king! And all of them answered, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! He replied, Shall I crucify your king? Whereupon they shouted unanimously, We have no other king than Caesar. 639. Pilate permitted himself to be overcome by the obstinacy and malice of the Jews on the day of the Parasave, then seated in his tribunal, which in Greek was called Lithostratos, and in Hebrew Gabbatha. He pronounced the sentence of death against the author of life, as I shall relate in the following chapter. The Jews departed from the hall in great exultation and joy, proclaiming the sentence of the most innocent lamb. That they did not realize whom they thus sought to annihilate was the occasion of our redemption. All this was well known to the sorrowful mother, who though outside the hall of judgment saw all the proceedings by exalted vision. When the priests and Pharisees rushed forth exulting in the condemnation of Christ to the death of the cross, the pure heart of this most blessed mother was filled with new sorrow, was pierced and transfixed with the sword of unalleviated bitterness. Since the sorrow of Most Holy Mary on this occasion surpassed all that can enter the thoughts of man, it is useless to speak more of it, and it must be referred to the pious meditation of Christians. Just as impossible is it to enumerate her interior acts of adoration, worship, reverence, love, compassion, sorrow, and resignation. Instruction which the Great Queen and Lady of Heaven gave me. 640. My daughter, thou reflectest with wonder upon the hardness and malice of the Jews, the weakness of Pilate, who knew of their evil dispositions and permitted himself to be overcome, though fully convinced of the innocence of my son and lord. I wish to relieve thee of this astonishment by furnishing thee with instructions and warnings suitable for making thee careful on the path to eternal life. Know then that the ancient prophecies concerning the mysteries of the redemption and all the holy scriptures were to be infallibly fulfilled. For sooner shall heaven and earth fall to pieces than that their words fail of their effect as determined in the divine mind. In order that the most ignominious death foretold for my Lord should be brought about, it was necessary that he should be persecuted by men. But that these men should happen to be the Jews, the priests, and the unjust Pilate was their own misfortune, not the choice of the Almighty who wishes to save all. 
Their own wickedness and malice brought them to their ruin, for they resisted the great grace of having in their midst the Redeemer and Master, of knowing Him, of conversing with Him, of hearing His doctrine and preaching, of witnessing His miracles. And they had received such great favors as none of the ancient patriarchs had attained by all their longings. Hence the cause of the Savior was justified. He manifestly had cultivated his vineyard by his own hands and showered his favors upon it. But it brought him only thorns and briars, and its keepers took away his life, refusing to recognize him as their opportunity and their duty before all other men. 641. This same which happened in the head Christ, the Lord, and Son of God must happen to all the members of his mystical body, that is, so the just and predestined to the end of the world. For it would be monstrous to see the members incongruous with the head, the children show no relation with the Father, or the disciples unlike their master. Although sinners must always exist, since in this world the just shall always be maligned with the unjust, the predestined with the reprobate, the persecutors with the persecuted, the murderers with the murdered, the afflicting with the afflicted, yet these lots are decided by the malice and goodness of men. Unhappy shall be he, through whom scandal comes into the world, and who thus makes himself an instrument of the demon. This kind of activity was begun in the new church by the priests and Pharisees, and by Pilate, who all persecuted the head of the mystic body, and the further course of the world, by all those who persecuted its members, the saints and the predestined, imitating and following the Jews and the devil in their evil work. 642. Think well then, my dearest, which of these lots thou wishest to choose in the sight of my son and me. If thou seest thy Redeemer, thy spouse, and thy chief tormented, afflicted, crowned with thorns, and saturated with reproaches, and at the same time desirest to have a part in him, and be a member of his mystical body, it is not becoming or even possible that thou live steeped in the pleasures of the flesh. Thou must be the persecuted and not a persecutor, the oppressed and not the oppressor, the one that bears the cross, that encounters the scandal and not that gives it, the one that suffers and at the same time makes none of the neighbors suffer. On the contrary, thou must exert thyself for their conversion and salvation in as far as is compatible with the perfection of thy state and vocation. This is the portion of the friends of God and the inheritance of his children in mortal life. In this consists the participation in grace and glory which, by his torments and reproaches, and by his death of the cross, my Son and Lord has purchased for them. I too have cooperated in this work and have paid the sorrows and afflictions which thou hast understood and which I wish thou shalt never allow to be blotted out from my inmost memory. The Almighty would indeed have been powerful enough to exalt his predestined in this world, to give them riches and favors beyond those of others, to make them strong as lions, for reducing the rest of mankind to their invincible power. But it was inopportune to exalt them in this manner, in order that men might not be led into the error of thinking that greatness consists in what is visible and happiness in earthly goods lest being induced to forsake virtues and obscure the glory of the Lord, they failed to experience the efficacy of divine grace and ceased to aspire towards spiritual and eternal things. This is the science which I wish thee to study continually, and in which thou must advance day by day, putting into practice all that thou learnest to understand and know. Chapter 21 Pilate pronounces the sentence of death against the author of life. The Lord takes up the cross on which he is to die. His most holy mother follows him. What she did on this occasion to restrain the devil and other happenings. 643. To the great satisfaction and joy of the priests and Pharisees, Pilate then decreed the sentence of death on the cross against life itself, Jesus our Savior. Having announced it to the one, they had thus condemned, in spite of his innocence, they brought him to another part of the house of Pilate, where they stripped him of the purple mantle in which they had derided him as a mock king. All happened by the mysterious dispensation of God, though on their part it was due to the concerted malice of the Jews, for they wished to see him undergo the punishment of the cross in his own clothes, so that in them he might be recognized by them all. Only by his garments could he now be recognized by the people, since his face had been disfigured beyond recognition 
by the scourging, the impure spittle, and the crown of thorns. They again clothed him with the seamless tunic which, at the command of the queen, was brought to him by the angels, for the executioners had thrown it into a corner of another room in the house, where they left it to place upon him the mocking and scandalous purple cloak. But the Jews neither understood nor noticed any of these circumstances, since they were too much taken up with the desire of hastening his death. 644. Through the diligence of the Jews in spreading the news of the sentence decreed against Jesus of Nazareth, the people hastened in multitudes to the house of Pilate in order to see him brought forth to execution. Since the ordinary number of inhabitants was increased by the gathering of numerous strangers from different parts to celebrate the Pasch, the city was full of people. All of them were stirred by the news and filled the streets up to the very palace of Pilate. It was a Friday, the day of the Perceive, which in Greek signifies preparation or getting ready. For on that day the Jews preparing themselves or got ready for the ensuing Sabbath, their greatest feast, on which no servile work was to be performed, not even such as cooking meals. All this had to be done on Friday. In the sight of all these multitudes, they brought forth our Savior in his own garments and with a countenance so disfigured by wounds blood and spittle, that no one would have again recognized him as the one they had seen or known before. At the command of his afflicted mother, the holy angels had a few times wiped off some of the impure spittle, but his enemies had so persistently continued in their disgusting insults that now he appeared altogether covered by their vile expectorations. At the sight of such a sorrowful spectacle, a confused shouting and clamor arose from the people, so that nothing could be understood. But all formed one uproar and confusion of voices. But above all the rest were heard the shouts of the priests and Pharisees, who in their unrestrained joy and exultation harangued the people to become quiet and clear the streets through which the divine victim was to pass. In order that they might hear the sentence of death proclaimed against him, the people were divided and confused in their opinions, according to the suggestions of their own hearts. At this spectacle were present different kinds of people, who had benefited and succored by the miracles and the kindness of Jesus, and such as heard and accepted his teachings and had become his followers and friends. These now showed their sympathy, some in bitter tears, others by asking what this man had done to deserve such punishment. Others were dumbfounded and began to be troubled and confused by this universal confusion and tumult. 645. Of the eleven apostles, St. John alone was present. He, with the sorrowful mother, and the three Mary stood within sight of the Lord, though in a retired corner. When the holy apostle saw his divine master brought forth, the thought of whose love toward himself now shot through his mind. He was so filled with grief that his blood congealed in his veins, and his face took on the appearance of death. The three Marys fell away into a prolonged swoon, but the queen of virtues remained unconquered, and her magnanimous heart, though overwhelmed by a grief beyond all conception of man, never fainted or swooned. She did not share the imperfections or weaknesses of the others. In all her actions, she was most prudent, courageous, and admirable. Calmly she comforted St. John and the pious women, she besought the Lord to strengthen them in order that she might have their company to the end of the Passion. In virtue of this prayer, the apostles and the holy women were consoled and encouraged so that they regained their senses and could speak to the mistress of heaven. Amid all this bitterness and confusion, she did nothing unbecoming or inconsiderate, but shed forth incessant tears with the dignity of a queen. Her attention was riveted upon her son, the true God. She prayed to the Eternal Father and offered to him his sorrows and torments, imitating in her actions all that was done by our Savior. She recognized the malice of sin, penetrated the mysteries of the redemption, appealed to the angels and interceded for friends and enemies, while giving way to her maternal love and to the sorrows corresponding to it. She at the same time practiced all the virtues, exciting the highest admiration of heaven and delighting in the highest degree of eternal Godhead. 
Since it is not possible for me to describe the sentiments filling the heart of this mother of wisdom, nor those at times also uttered by her lips, I leave them to the imagined by Christian piety. 646. The servants and priests sought to quiet the multitudes in order that they might be able to hear the sentence pronounced against Jesus of Nazareth. For after it had been made known to him in person, they desired to have it read before the people and in his presence. When the people had quieted down, they began to read it in a loud voice so that all could hear it, while Jesus was standing in full view as a criminal. The sentence was proclaimed also in the different streets and at the foot of the cross. It was afterwards published and spread in many copies. According to the understanding given to me, the copies were a faithful reproduction, excepting some words which have been added. I will not discuss them, for the exact words of this sentence have been shown me, and I give them here without change. Literal rendering of the sentence of death pronounced against Jesus of Nazareth, our Savior. 647. I, Pontius Pilate, presiding over Lower Galilee and governing Jerusalem, in felty to the Roman Empire, and being within the executive mansion, judge, decide, and proclaim that I condemn to death Jesus of Nazareth and a Galilean by birth, a man seditious and opposed to our laws, to our senate, and to the great emperor Tiberius Caesar. For the execution of this sentence I decree that his death be upon the cross, and that he shall be fastened thereto with nails as is customary with criminals. Because in this very place, gathering around him every day, many men, poor and rich, he has continued to raise tumults throughout Judea, proclaiming himself the Son of God and King of Israel, at the same time threatening the ruin of this renowned city of Jerusalem and its temple, and of the sacred empire, refusing tribute to Caesar. And because he dared to enter in triumph the city of Jerusalem and the temple of Solomon, accompanied by a great multitude of the people carrying branches of palms, I command the first centurion called Quintus Cornelius to lead him for his greater shame through the said city of Jerusalem, bound as he is and scourged by the orders. Let him also wear his own garments, that he may be known to all, and let him carry the cross on which he is to be crucified. Let him walk through the public streets between two other thieves, who are likewise condemned to death for their robberies and murders, so that this punishment be an example to all the people and to all malefactors. I desire also, and command in this my sentence, that this malefactor, having been thus led through the public streets, be brought outside the city through the Pagora Gate, now called the Antinonian Portal, and under the proclamations of the herald, who shall mention all the crimes pointed out in my sentence, he shall be conducted to the summit of the mountain called Calvary, where justice is wont to be executed upon wicked transgressors. There, fastened and crucified upon the cross which he shall carry, as decreed above, his body shall remain between the aforesaid thieves. Above the cross, that is, at its top, he shall have placed for him his name and title in the three languages, namely in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. And in all and each one of them shall be written, This is Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, so that it may be understood by all and become universally known. At the same time, I command that no one, no matter of what condition, under pain of the loss of his goods and life, and under punishment for rebellion against the Roman Empire, presume audaciously to impede the execution of this just sentence, ordered by me to be executed with all rigor, according to the decrees and laws of the Romans and Hebrews. Year of the creation of the world, 5233, the 25th day of March. Pontius Pilatus Eudex et Gubernatur Galilea Inferioris pro Romano Imperio qui supra propria manu. Pontius Pilate, judge and governor of Lower Galilee for the Roman Empire, who signed the above with his own hand. 648. According to the above reckoning, the creation of the world happened in March, and from the day on which Adam was created until the incarnation of the Word, 5,199 years, adding the nine months during which he remained in the virginal womb of his most holy mother. In the 33 years of his life, we complete the 5,233 years and three months, which according to the reckoning of the Romans intervened between the anniversary of his birth and the 25th of March, the day of his death. 
According to the reckoning of the Roman church, there are no more than nine months and seven days to the first year, since it begins its count of years with the first of January of the second year of the world. Of all the opinions of the teachers of the church, I have understood the one which corresponds to the reckoning of the Roman church in the Roman martyrology to be the correct one. This I have also stated in the chapter of the Incarnation of Christ, our Lord, in the first book of the second part, chapter 11. 649. The sentence of Pilate against our Savior, having been published in a loud voice before all the people, the executioners loaded the heavy cross on which he was to be crucified upon his tender and wounded shoulders. In order that he might carry it, they loosened the bonds holding his hands, but not the others since they wished to drag him along by those loose ends of the ropes that bound his body. In order to torment him the more, they drew two loops around his throat. The cross was fifteen feet long of thick and heavy timbers. The herald began to proclaim the sentence, and the whole confused and turbulent multitude of the people, the executioners and soldiers with great noise, uproar and disorder, began to move from the house of Pilate to Mount Calvary through the streets of Jerusalem. The master and redeemer of the world, Jesus, before receiving the cross, looked upon it with a countenance full of extreme joy and exultation, as would be shown by a bridegroom looking at the rich adornments of his bride, and on receiving it, he addressed it as follows. 650. O cross, beloved of my soul, now prepared and ready to still my longings, come to me, that I may be received in thy arms, and that attached to them as on an altar, I may be accepted by the Eternal Father as the sacrifice of his everlasting reconciliation with the human race. In order to die upon thee, I have descended from heaven and assumed mortal and passable flesh, for thou art to be the scepter with which I shall triumph over all my enemies, the key with which I shall open the gates of heaven for all the predestined. Isaiah 22.22 22. The sanctuary in which the guilty sons of Adam shall find mercy, and the treasure house for the enrichment of their poverty. Upon thee I desire to exalt and recommend dishonor and reproach among men, in order that my friends may embrace them with joy, seek them with anxious longings, and follow me on the path which I, through thee, shall open up before them. My Father and eternal God, I confess thee as the Lord of heaven and earth, subjecting myself to thy power and to thy divine wishes. I take upon my shoulders the wood for the sacrifice of my innocent and passable humanity, and I accept it willingly for the salvation of men. Receive thou, eternal Father, this sacrifice as acceptable to thy justice, in order that from today on they may not any more be servants, but sons and heirs of the kingdom together with me. 651. None of these sacred mysteries and happenings were hidden from the great lady of the world, Mary, for she had a most intimate knowledge and understanding of them, far beyond that of all the angels. The events which she could not see with the eyes of her body she perceived by her intelligence and revealed science, which manifested to her the interior operation of her most holy son. By this divine light she recognized the infinite value of the wood of the cross after once it had come to contact with the deified humanity of Jesus our Redeemer. Immediately she venerated and adored it in a manner befitting it, the same was also done by the heavenly spirits attending upon the queen. She imitated her divine son in the tokens of affection, with which he received the cross, addressing it in the words suited to her office, as co-adjutrix of the Redeemer. By her prayers to the Eternal Father, she followed him in his exalted sentiments as the living original and exemplar, without failing in the least point. When she heard the voice of the herald publishing and rehearsing the sentence through the streets, the Heavenly Mother in protest against the accusations contained in the sentence and in the form of comments on the glory and honor of the Lord composed a canticle of praise and worship of the innocence and sinlessness of her all-holy Son and God. In the composing of this canticle, the holy angels helped her. Conjointly with them, she arranged and repeated it, while the inhabitants of Jerusalem were blaspheming their own Creator and Savior. 652 as all the faith, knowledge, and love of creatures during this time of the Passion was enshrined in its highest essence in the magnanimous soul of the Mother of Wisdom, she alone had the most proper conception and correct judgment of the suffering and death of God for men, without for a moment failing in the attention necessary to exterior actions. 
Her wisdom penetrated all the mysteries of the redemption and the manner in which it was to be accomplished through the ignorance of the very men who were to be redeemed. She entered into the deepest consideration of the dignity of the one who was suffering, of what he was suffering, from and for whom he was suffering, of the dignity of the person of Christ our Redeemer uniting with himself the divine and the human natures, of their perfections and attributes, the most blessed Mary alone possessed the highest and intuitive knowledge outside of the Lord himself. On this account, she alone, among all mere creatures, attached sufficient importance to the passion and death of her son and of the true God. Of what he suffered, she was not only an eyewitness, but she experienced it personally within herself, occasioning the holy envy not only of men, but of the angels themselves who were not thus favored. But they well knew that their great queen and mistress felt and suffered in soul and body the same torments and sorrows as her most holy son, and that the holy trinity was inexpressibly pleased with her. And therefore they sought to make up by their praise and worship for the pains which they could not share. Sometimes when the sorrowful mother could not personally witness the sufferings of her son, she was made to feel in her virginal body and in her spirit the effects of his torments before her intelligence made her aware of them. Thus surprised, she would say, Ah, what new martyrdom have they devised for my sweetest Lord and Master? And then she would receive the clearest knowledge of what the Lord was enduring. The most loving mother was so admirably faithful in her sufferings and in imitating the example of Christ our God that she never permitted herself any easement either of her bodily pains such as rest or nourishment or sleep nor any relaxation of the spirit such as any consoling thoughts or considerations except when she was visited from on high by divine influence. Then only would she humbly and thankfully accept relief in order that she might recover strength to attend still more fervently to the object of her sorrows and to the cause of his sufferings, the same wise consideration. She applied to the malicious behavior of the Jews and their servants, to the needs of the human race, to their threatening ruin, and to the ingratitude of men for whom he suffered. Thus, she perfectly and intimately knew all of these things and felt it more deeply than all the creatures. 653. Another hidden and astonishing miracle was wrought by the hand of God through the instrumentality of the Blessed Mary against Lucifer and his infernal spirits. It took place in the following manner. The dragon and his associates, though they could not understand the humiliation of the Lord, were most attentive to all that happened in the passion of the Lord. Now, when he took himself upon the cross, all these enemies felt a new and mysterious tremor and weakness, which caused in them great consternation and confused distress. Conscious of these unwanted and invisible feelings, the Prince of Darkness feared that in the passion and death of Christ our Lord, some dire and irreparable destruction of his reign was imminent. In order not to be overtaken by it, the presence of Christ our God, the dragon, resolved to retire and fly with all his followers to the caverns of hell. But when he sought to execute this resolve, he was prevented by the great queen and mistress of all creation. For the Most High enlightening her and intimating to her, what she was to do, and at the same time invested her with his power. The Heavenly Mother, turning toward Lucifer and his squadrons by her imperial command, hindered them from flying, ordering them to await and witness the Passion to the end on Mount Calvary. The demons could not resist the command of the Mighty Queen, for they recognized and felt the divine power operating in her. Subject to her sway, they followed Christ as so many prisoners dragged along in chains to Calvary, where the eternal wisdom had decreed to triumph over them from the throne of the cross, as we shall see later on. There is nothing which can exemplify the disagreement and dismay which from that moment began to oppress Lucifer and his demons. According to our way of speaking, they walked along to Calvary, like criminals condemned to a terrible death and seized by the dismay and consternation of an inevitable punishment. This punishment of the demon was in conformity with his malicious nature and proportioned to the evil committed by him in introducing death and sin into the world to remedy which God himself was now undergoing death. 654. Our Savior proceeded on the way to Calvary, bearing upon his shoulders, according to the saying of Isaiah, his own government and principality, Isaiah 9.6, which was none else from his cross, from whence he was to subject and govern the world, meeting thereby that his name should be exalted above all other names, and rescuing the human race from the tyrannical power of the demon over the sons of Adam. Colossians 2.15. 
The same Isaiah calls it the yoke and scepter of the oppressor and executor, who is imperiously exacting the tribute of the first guilt, in order to destroy this tyrant and break the scepter of his reign and the yoke of our servitude. Christ our Savior placed the cross upon his shoulders, namely upon the place where are born both the yokes of slavery and the scepter of royal power. He wished to intimate thereby that he despoiled the demon of this power and transferred it to his own shoulders, in order that thenceforth the captive children of Adam should recognize him for their legitimate lord and true king. All mortals were to follow him in the way of the cross, and learn that by this cross they were subjected to his power, and now become his vassals and servants, bought by his own life blood. 655. But alas, the pity of our most ungrateful forgetfulness, that the Jews and ministers of the Passion should be ignorant of this mystery hidden to princes of this world, and that they should not dare touch the cross of the Savior, because they consider it the wood of ignominy and shame, which was their own fault and a very great one. Yet not so great as our own, since its mysteries being already revealed to us, we spend our indignation only on the blindness of those who are persecuting our Lord and God. For if we blame them for being ignorant of what they ought to have known, how much should we blame ourselves, who knowing and confessing Christ our Redeemer, persecute and crucify him by our offenses? O my sweetest love, Jesus, light of my intellect and glory of my soul, do not, O my Lord, trust in my sluggish torpidity to follow thee with my cross on the way. Take it upon thee to do me this favor, draw me after thee, to run after the fragrance of thy sweetest love, of thy ineffable patience, of thy deepest humility, that I may desire for contempt and anguish, and seek after participation in thy ignominy, insults, and sorrows. Let this be my portion and my inheritance in this mortal and oppressing life. Let this be my glory and my repose, and outside of the cross and its ignominy, I desire not to live or be consoled or to partake of any of the rest or enjoyment. As the Jews and all that blind multitude avoided the touch of the cross of him, who was so innocently sentenced to die upon it. He opened with it a passage and cleared for himself a way. His perfidious persecutors looked upon his glorious dishonor as a contagion, and they fled from its approach. Though all the rest of the streets were full of shouting and clamoring people, who crowded aside as the herald advanced proclaiming the sentence. 656. The executioners, bare of all human compassion and kindness, dragged our Savior Jesus, along with incredible cruelty and insults. Some of them jerked him forward by the ropes in order to accelerate his passage, while others pulled from behind in order to retard it. On account of this jerking and the way of the cross, they caused him to sway to and fro, and often to fall to the ground. By the hard knocks he thus received on the rough stones, great wounds were opened, especially on the two knees, and they were widened at each repeated fall. The heavy cross also inflicted a wound on the shoulder on which it was carried. The unsteadiness caused the cross sometimes to knock against his sacred head, and sometimes the head against the cross. Thus the thorns of his crown penetrated deeper and wounded the parts which they had not yet reached. To these torments of the body the ministers of evil added many insulting words and execrable affronts, ejecting their impure spittle and throwing the dirt of the pavement into his face so mercilessly that they blinded the eyes that looked upon them with such divine mercy. Thus they, of their own account, condemned themselves to the loss of the graces with which his very looks were fraught, by the haste with which they dragged him along in their eagerness to see him die. They did not allow him to catch his breath. For his most innocent body, having been in so few hours overwhelmed with such a storm of torments, was so weakened and bruised, that to all appearances he was ready to yield up life under his pains and sorrows. 657.